Lord, for our time of fellowship, our time together. For you've told us, Lord, that we should not forsake ourselves gathering together in these days, especially as these days are getting more and more, Lord, towards the fulfillment of every prophecy that we believe that we're living in the last days. And Lord, we need to come together. We need to gather together. Hallelujah. Say amen. amen. We need to come together unto you, Lord, because that's where you move in that corporate anointing. Everybody say corporate anointing. corporate anointing. That corporate anointing is when we all come together and the Holy Spirit moves in a very special way because by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established to be from God. And the church is made up of many witnesses. The church is not a building. It is a people. It is the assembly. It is the community of God. It is the family of God. It's the building is just where we're at. We could be in a home. We could be somewhere outside. It doesn't matter. The Lord says in the last days, I'm going to have a church without walls. Amen. Hallelujah. We believe that today, and we just honor you, and we thank you for the reality of the Holy Spirit, the reality of your presence, Lord, that comes to us and shows up and bears witness that the Bible says the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Yes, so we have that inner witness today. Amen. Hallelujah. Say, I'm a, I'm a witness. Say, I have the inner witness. The inner and the Spirit of God is a witness. The is. And he's the one witnessing to you right now. Yes. And he's going to give you the faith you need to believe God. How many need some more faith? Y'all should have said amen. amen. We never have enough faith. But he has all the faith we need. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit gives us the gift of faith. Yes. Amen. And the fruit of the Spirit is faith or faithfulness. Yes. You know, we're faithful because he's faithful. Yes. What's faithful? Full of faith. Faithful. I want to be faithful. Amen. Who wants to be full of faith? Amen. How many want to be full of fear? Yes. You going to sign up for that one? The Bible says in these last days that men's hearts will fail them because of fear. Fear is going to grip every person if, if we let it happen. But fear is the opposite of faith, and faith is the opposite of fear. Amen. And we have to stop complaining, because complaining is the opposite of praise. Amen. And God catches my tongue in midair. Shh. When, whenever I, I don't even realize sometimes I'm starting to complain about something. How many of the Bible says, let there be no complaining in our streets? in our homes amen? amen but pray about everything amen. turn and tell somebody pray about everything amen. let your prayers amen. let your prayers be the catalyst that cause a change to take place how many believe that prayer changes things amen. if you believe that then start praying more because the more you pray the more changes there's going to be amen. amen praise his holy name we give you honor lord let's give the lord a hand the bible says clap your hands all you people Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Voice of triumph means victory. Amen. There's something in your life you need to overcome. He's going to give you victory over it in Jesus' name. Amen. You believe that? Yes. How many believes that today? Amen. That every problem you have is just another opportunity to see the move of God in your life. Yes. To see God do something special. He said in Romans chapter 9, I think verse 16, he said, or 17, he said, For this very purpose I have raised Pharaoh up, that I might show my great and mighty power in you. On, so if you have a Pharaoh in your life, something coming against you that you can't overcome, God says, I'm going to give you my power. I'm going to give you my supernatural ability, so that in all things you'll know that I'm the one that did it. God's still a giant killer. I said he's still a giant killer. He's still killing giants. Amen. All right, I guess that's good enough. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Today's message, I want to probably write a book on this one. And I, I have little books in me, maybe big books. But this is one I do think I'm going to title what this message is today. The title of our message is A Servant's Journey to the Throne. And I've taught on this in the past, but it's, it's just such an intriguing message, an interesting message, A, a, a Servant's Journey to the Throne. That we have to become servants before we learn what it means to be a ruler, before we can know what it means to ascend up to the throne with God, we have to learn to serve. Serve at the church, that's a great place to learn. Serve at home, serve on the job, everywhere you go, you are a servant. 
Number one, you're a servant to God. Amen. How many know that's the greatest badge you can wear? Amen. That's the greatest title you can have. Amen. How many believe that? Amen. What ministry are you called to? Well, I'm called to the ministry of an apostle. People love labels, and we have a prophetic calling in ministry, but we're not labeling ourselves. God's given us the unction for the function. Hallelujah. When you got the function from the unction, then you, you need to tell people, yes, I was called to be a prophet when I was 17, but I don't wear that as a, bra a badge. God has progressed in that ministry and grown me into that ministry over the years. It's a lifelong journey. Amen. But my lifelong journey is to be a servant Amen. of Christ and to learn how to serve him, Hallelujah. to serve him, Amen. not serve man, not be a man pleaser. Not be a people pleaser. Amen. You know, we want to please our, if you're married, you want to please your husband and your wife, right? Yeah. You want to make them happy? Oh, you don't care. You don't care about that. Oh, <laughs> you're supposed to try to make them happy. That's right. Okay, that's a good idea. How many's given up on doing that? But you know what? Don't ever give up on making him happy. Because then you won't be snappy. Yep. You'll stop being yappy. Happy you wife, happy life. <laughs> that's right. But when you're with Jesus, he makes everything work out. Everything becomes beautiful. Amen. How many know he's beautiful? Amen. Everything becomes beautiful. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says you will make everything beautiful in its time. Amen. Things might not look good right now, but God's going to turn it around. Amen. That's for somebody here today. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A servant's journey to the throne. We're on a journey. I wrote this down. Step by step, we're on a holy pursuit after God. We're running after God. It's a holy adventure. Amen? But on this journey, it's, it's a step-by-step -step process. We're going up. We're ascending. Say, I'm ascending. Say, I'm not backsliding. I'm upsliding. We don't want to keep going back to where we were because then you've got to start over again. But God wants you to keep making progress. Amen? We're going up what? The mountain. There's a mountain of God. There's a mountain of our full inheritance in Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is what? What is a full inheritance? The final inheritance is to rule with him Amen. on this earth yes. and into eternity. You know, God's calling you to rule yep. in the authority of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, you shall tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you, in Luke 10, 19. And tread means to crush under your feet. We were reading about how even when you cut a snake's head off, it can still attack you. you got to crush that head. The best way to kill a scorpion is to crush it. They don't die easy. And these demonic powers that are coming against us, they don't go away easily. They want to stick around. Even if you thought you cut its head off, it still wants to turn and come on you and do something to you. The Bible says to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Amen. We've got to have the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says that the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Where? In the mind, in the heart. In verse 5, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down. Say, I've got to cast down some things. Say that with me. I've got to cast down some things. Casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing who? You, bringing into captivity every thought Amen. to the obedience of Christ. Amen. And where's the Christ? Inside you, the Messiah, the anointed one. The Holy Spirit comes inside you, and when you're baptized in the Spirit, He's anointing the Christ within you. Because Christ means the anointing, the anointed one. Hallelujah. This is all introduction. Hallelujah. We're going up the mountain, and it, each step we take, we're receiving more, we're growing, we're progressing, we're increasing in the anointing, we're increasing in the knowledge of God, in the character of God, in the love of God, in the power of God, in the truth of God, in the revelation of God. We're going up higher and higher and higher. Somebody get a little bit excited. Come on, move your toe around or your finger or something. Because something's happening in your life. Something's happening in you. 
Turn and tell somebody, something's happening in you, so wake up. Something's happening in your life. God is working within you, that which is pleasing in His sight. God's working in you. That's good news. I said, that's good news. So we're going up, and, and don't lose your vision. If you, get, if, you get, if you lose your vision, this is all vision here. If we lose our vision, we're going to slow down. It says in, in, in what Proverbs 29, 18, where there's no vision, the people perish. There's no current prophetic revelation. Where the people are without self-control. It says in the Message Bible, when people don't know what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. That's when we get out of order. And when we start falling into man's ways, man's order. But we're not here as a religious group here today. We're not religious. How many know that? I don't believe in religion. Religion is man-made. We believe in homegrown, Holy Ghost, organic, no preservatives, Jesus. <laughs> That's the kind of church we want to be a part of. That's the kind of church service we want to have. And I couldn't, even, I couldn't even get along in most churches because I was called to be a prophet. Well, what does a prophet do? Good question. A prophet prophesies. Well, you know what? You can't prophesy in most churches. Did you find that out? How many found that out? You can prophesy here, and we'll test what you say. Then we'll let you. Praise God. We'll test it according to God's word. But when I, I had a problem. I was called to be a prophet, but there was nowhere to prophesy. Amen. And you know what? I went to Pastor Foster's church, Sweetwater Church of the Valley, and he allowed everybody to prophesy. He put an open mic on the right side and on the left side. And during the song service, it was a big church, like 800,000 people. And he said, between, if between the songs, if you get a word or something, you can come up here. Guess what? I was up there every week. Amen. And then I decided I was overdoing it. But I was growing every time I had a word, you know? And then I thought I was overdoing it. So I said, I'm not going to do that anymore. I just think, like, I'm always up here at the microphone. And I was always on the front row anyways in spitting range. I want to get some of that spit from the, from the prophet, you know? He was a mighty prophet of God. If you know anything about Glenn Foster, he was my spiritual father. And uh, I was on the front row one time. And I said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to get up there anymore. I'm doing this too much. I'm taking advantage of him. And we're, we're having the song service. At the end of the service, uh, you know, he's about ready to preach. All these people, packed audience. He looks down at me. And he goes, what are you doing? I'm like, huh? He's like, get up here and prophesy. Don't do that again. <laughs> prophet, prophet, burp, burp, prophet alert, burp, burp. Come on, this is a true prophet here. He was reading my mail right there. He's done that many times over the years, by the way. And you know, I said, okay, Lord, because I thought I could never be like him anyways. You know, I told you that before. He sounded like the book of Isaiah. I don't ever remember him. When he prophesied, he said, the, the mountain shall melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, and the glory shall be revealed, and a fire shall go out before him. I like, I can't sound like him. I get up there and go, my people, the Lord says that he wants to bless you. That's how I felt I was looking. And God said to me one day, he said, stop comparing yourself to him. I said, I'm not. He says, yes, you are. How many know who won that argument? God won that argument. The Lord said, stop looking at him. He has a tremendous gift, but you have your own gift. Turn and tell somebody, be yourself in Jesus. And Jesus will be himself in you. Just be yourself. You can't prophesy like me, and I can't prophesy like you. Rodney Howard Brown said, he said, you can't teach, teach someone to prophesy any more than you can teach a pig how to sing. <laughs> Amen. We're still in introduction here. So, all right. Hey Amen, you can't, you can't put this stuff on. Even get filled with the Holy Spirit and speak it in tongues. How many want the gift of tongues? Raise your tongue. You know, we believe that God can give you the gift of tongues. Amen. We'll help you, but only he can do it. Amen. Hey Amen, we don't believe in trying to make you do it. Say, yabba dabba do. Come on, I don't know. <laughs> hallelujah, 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 until you stumble over it. No, just open your mouth and he will fill it. Amen. He says, open your mouth and I will fill it. Yes. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. How many want to keep going up the mountain? But you know, at the top of that mountain is his glory, and that glory is a throne. And in that throne, there's a place of leadership in your life where you're going to take the lead role. You're going to start taking over. You're going to start overcoming. Every place the soul of your foot shall tread upon, you shall overtake that land. You shall possess that land. You will say, this is God's. 
Jesus Christ is Lord of my job. Jesus Christ is Lord of my finances. Don't say amen. amen. Jesus Christ is Lord of my family, amen. of my life, of my body, of my mind. Yes. You start letting him take possession over everything. If he's Lord, then he's king, and a king does what? He rules. Amen. I was curious because I'm a curious person. I looked up in the dictionary the, the word king. You know what it means? A ruler. Duh. It means a ruler. God wants you to rule. He wants you to be the one that makes a deciding decision over things in your life. Hallelujah. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. And when wives submit to their husbands as unto the Lord, it's unto the Lord. Amen. Don't look at the man, man. Don't look at the man, woman. Don't, don't look at the man and all his imperfections and problems. That's not what God said. God didn't say, well, you can't, you can't be under his authority because he's got so many imperfections. Well, yeah, we know that, especially when you've been married a while. You can see it all. <laughs> Even in the church, there's no perfect church. There's no perfect marriage. Because we're not perfect. Amen. But the perfect one lives inside of us. Amen. And we only can submit as unto him because we're looking to him. If you can see Jesus in your husband, you've got the victory. If you can see the work of the Holy Spirit in your husband, then you can submit to that. Yeah. Then you can listen to that. Then you can let him rule over the household. Yeah. Well, people don't like this stuff. Man, that one, that one man got in trouble just for giving that kind of speech, right? Oh, yeah. But, you know, that's the only way it works is you only can see Jesus in one another. We can't see, we can't look in the flesh. And it's so hard when you're living at home with the same person, right? Even Jesus said a prophet has no honor among his own. It's so true. But you got to stop looking in the natural and look in the spirit. Amen? Amen? And if your husband's got a lot of problems, then what should you be doing? You should be on your knees praying for him. Amen. Boy, it got quiet in here. If you're fed up and you're disgusted and busted with Gus. If you said, I can't do this any longer, you know, get on your knees and pray for him. Amen. Believe God. Believe God to change his life. Believe God to change her life. Divorce is not in the equation. No. I said divorce is not in the equation. Amen. Amen. We want to go up higher with God, then we got to do it God's way, not our way. And his way is his word. Amen. Am I preaching? Yes. It's his word. But listen, there's flaws in everybody. And if you have a fault-finding spirit, you'll find those faults because you got a fault-finding spirit. Uh -huh. Some people got a fault-finding demonic spirit. They come into the church with that spirit, and boy, it doesn't take long. First, they love you. You're number one. You're the best. You're the greatest church, the best preacher, the best everything. And then all of a sudden, there's this problem, that problem. I don't know about them. I don't know about her. I'm not gonna, I don't like that song. I don't like the way he looks at me. I don't like it. And all of a sudden, you find nothing but faults. Preaching too loud, he preaches too long. Why don't you get on with the message? It's called a critical spirit. And a critical spirit will destroy the work of the Holy Spirit. It will stop. He can never stop God, but he will stop in, in that person. And we got to take off that critical attitude and say, no, I see the good things God is doing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many know we got to be thankful? There's so many things to be thankful for. And I don't think we're thankful enough. I really don't. There's so many things we, we need to be thankful for. Yeah, but you don't know my, my problems. Yeah, but I know the one who gives the victory over them. And if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. You know, you know, I heard this, and it's so true. There's always someone worse off than you. I heard that from little Richard. I met little Richard. I really did. I met little Richard over in California. He got saved. Richard Pittman. I met him. You know what? He sang a song that said that. He sang a song that said, there's always somebody worse off than you. You know, he's a, he's a father of rock and roll, yeah. you know, and he was different, wasn't he? <laughs> but he said, he said, you know, you think you got it bad. There's always someone's got it worse than you. Right. Amen. We need to be thankful. There are three steps up to that throne. Three steps I'm going to talk about. Today, we're going to talk about the first one, but the first one is servanthood discipleship and stewardship and we talked about this before but this is a good foundational teaching series for anybody that's why i think i'll put it in a book because we need it we really need it people come here they go well, what am i supposed to do serve Amen. what does god have for my life he wants you to serve serve him when you serve others you're serving him but this text scripture has been a scripture that was kind of different scripture 
I've taught it before, but I went into a greater depth of it. And it's in Isaiah 65, verse 8 through 10 in your notes there. And this is a powerful scripture. I love scriptures that you haven't really considered before, that I haven't considered before, that we can stop and look at what God is trying to tell us. Something fresh. Amen? Amen. Thus says the Lord. Amen. As the wine, new wine is found in the cluster of grapes, and one says, do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake. Everybody say, for my servant's sake. That I might not destroy them all. I will bring forth a seed and offspring from Jacob and from Judah, an heir of my mountains, and my chosen ones, my elect, shall inherit it and possess it, and my servants shall dwell there and be permanently settled. Sharon shall be a fold of flocks, and the valley of Echor a place for herds to lie down for my people who have sought me. Hallelujah. Isn't that? That's very deep. It, we have to take the Old Testament scriptures and apply them right now into the New Testament because the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, right? But the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. The Old Testament is the shadow. The New Testament is the substance. I'm teaching you. I'm teaching you this morning. So when he says, thus says the Lord, and we've taught on this scripture, but I want to get into the first aspect of this, taking that step up to the very throne of God. There's steps to get to that throne room. Hallelujah. And the first one is servanthood. Amen. He says there that he's going to do this for his servants. Don't destroy it. Don't destroy this cluster of grapes. It doesn't look good. It looks bad. It looks like it's not ripe. Just throw it away. It's useless. But God says, oh, no, no, no. I will not destroy it. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to preserve it because there's a blessing found in it. There's a blessing there. Don't give up on the things that God is doing in your life. Don't say, I see nothing but negativity. Look for the blessing. Look for the good things of God. Look for what the Holy Spirit has done in your life and what he will do because Jesus is still the author and the finisher of your faith. What God started, he's going to begin. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he that has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. God's going to finish what he started. That cluster of grapes is going to be very ripe one day. It's going to be worth a lot. And we can't, we can't be people that throw away those things in people's lives because of their faults and problems. And there's something going on. No, the Lord says, no, no, no. There's, there's new wine there. That new wine is going to mature. It's going to become valuable. It's going to become something so precious and so tasteful that it's going to be worth a lot. And you could pour it out. You could pour it out into others. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we have to be careful when we get upset with one another, when we see nothing but problems. We have to see that cluster of grapes. God says, you know what? I'm not going to destroy it. Why? For I will do this for my servant's sake. So when you become a servant, then God says, now I'm going to keep that cluster of grapes. I'm going to keep it until it grows, until it matures. Why? Because my servants are serving me. They're taking care of those grapes. They're not going to let them go to waste. They're not going to let the little foxes come in and eat the vine. Hallelujah. And he says, and I'll bring forth a seed and offspring. God's got an offspring. Say, I'm his offspring. See, God's going to bring forth his people, his seed, his offspring from Jacob, which means the one was the deceiver. Out of our flesh, God's going to bring forth the Holy Spirit. And from Judah, which means praise and heir of my mountains. God's calling you this right here in the scriptures to be an heir. That means you're going to inherit. You're an heir of his mountains of his high places, and my chosen ones, my elect, shall inherit and possess it. That word inherit means you're going to live there. You're going to possess it. It's going to belong to you. You're going to be a carrier of God's glory. You're going up that mountain. Come on. You're going up the mountain of God. It belongs to you. God wants you to be in a high place. How many know a mountain speaks of a place of advantage? It's a vantage point. When you're up high, the enemy can't get you. You can see him coming before he gets there. Amen. It's a place of protection. It's a place of security. Amen. And my servants shall dwell there. See, that's where God's servants are. Where? In the mountains of God. Say, I want to dwell in the mountain. Say, I want to live there. I want to be there permanently. That word permanently means that you're going to rest there. You're going to stop running around here and there all over the place. You're not going to be up and down as a Christian, 
up one day, down the next. No, God says, I'm going to establish you in my mountain. I'm going to establish you in my victory. I'm going to establish you in the things of God. I'm going to establish you in my power. You're going to stand in the power of my presence. You're going to know what it means that I can even spread forth before you in the presence of your enemies a feasting table. Psalm 23 says, God's going to do that for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then he says that he's going to call Sharon, which we taught that on Wednesday night in our Bible study, that Sharon was a place that was green and fertile. The Bible talks about that in different places. He's going to make it bud and and blossom forth. And and, and it's just such a beautiful place with green pastures, but it had been destroyed. But God says it's going to be restored, and it's going to be a place again for the flocks to lie down. I don't know where the flock of God. God's got green pastures for you today. He says he will cause us to lie down in green pastures. Hallelujah. Amen. How many like that idea instead of the rocks out there? Amen. Not even artificial turf, but the real thing. Green grass that you can lay down in. And it's a place where they can feed and get taken care of. How many know that the flocks have to have some grass to eat? God's going to take care of you. God's going to take He's going to nourish you. And it says it's going to be the valley of Acor is a place for herds to lie down. It's going to be a place where they can rest. How many know God wants you to enter into rest? God wants to teach you his grace. It's a place where you're settled and not moved. Nothing's going to shake you. And the valley of Achor was not a good place. God says, I'm going to make it a place of blessing. Achor comes from the name Achan, where in Joshua, Achan took a garment that didn't belong to him when they defeated, it was called a Babylonian garment, and he took it and he hid it. And because he hid it and didn't tell anybody, the Lord would not give victory to the army of Israel. Right? And so something happened, and you know God said? There's sin in the camp. The reason why you didn't overcome, the reason why you didn't defeat your enemy, the reason why the children of Israel ran from their enemy, God says, they're not, God says I always give you victory, but there's sin in the camp. And you've got to deal with that sin in the camp. We've got to deal with the sin in our lives. We've got to deal with the sins that are in the church. We want the blessing of God. And he said to Joshua, he said, I won't be with you anymore. Whoa. Well, that's really bad news because they really needed God. They were out in the middle of the wilderness, in the middle of nowhere, and he was their only hope. He was their only help. Sometimes we turn to other things besides God, but when you're in a place like they were, there's no other way to turn. There's no one to help. He's the only Savior. Amen. He said, I'm not going to be with you anymore if you don't deal with this. And he said, well, Lord, Lord, show us what it is. And he showed him exactly where it was. God will show you. And you know what he said to Achan? Your sin will find you out. You try to hide it, but your sin will find you out. Amen. It's better to confess it. It's better to get rid of it than have it found out. And the Bible says that they had to destroy him and his whole household because of that. And now this valley that had that name was a place that means misery and trouble and stress God says, I'm going to turn around. It's going to be a place for you to lie down, hallelujah, and rest and have the peace of God in your life. How many want some rest instead of of stress? How many is tired of your stress? This this scripture right here says God will set you free from that stress. In Exodus 15, 17, that's a scripture that's awesome. It says, you will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. God was bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. He brought them through the Red Sea. And then he prophesied and said in Exodus 15, he says, I'm going to bring my people out of this wilderness. I'm going to bring them into the mountain of my inheritance. Say my inheritance. And he goes, and I will establish them there. See, God's going to plant you there in that mountain, in the place of his sanctuary that his hands have established. This is God's resting place. This is where God wants you to be. He's going to establish you. What's that mean? Establish means you can't be moved. Hallelujah. He's bolted you down. He cemented you down on the rock of ages that can't roll. He's the rock that doesn't roll. He's going to put you in that place where when things come your way, you're going to stand firm. You're not going to be shaken by it. And we need that word more than any other time right now that we're living in where everything is being shaken that can be shaken. People are being shaken. Come on. People don't know which way to turn. People are looking for the answers. They have no answers. Amen. Number one, servanthood is the first step to the throne. Say that with me. Servanthood is the first step to the throne. You must be a servant before you can be a king. 
And if you are called to be a leader, you have to first learn to serve. Amen. If you are a leader in the body of Christ, even more so. Wherever you are as a leader, you must first learn to serve. You must lead by example. You must lead by your character. This servanthood is not just what you do, it's who you are. Amen. You are a servant, so you serve. You have the character of Christ, who the Bible says became the lowliest slave and servant, Philippians 2 says, when he went to the cross. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, he says in Philippians 2. See, we have to have the same attitude, the same mind. And that's the heart of a servant. God, change our hearts, change our character so that we will have the heart of Jesus. We'll have a heart that wants to give our lives away. That we'll have that heart of your love that is so great in our lives, that's motivating us, that we're willing to be like Paul the Apostle. Get shipwrecked, get stoned. I mean, he, he had more things happen to him than any Christian. But he did it all for Jesus. We need to have the heart of the servant. Servanthood is having the heart of God in us. How many has been a servant? Amen. Then continue. Amen. Set up question. Then continue to serve. Be Amen. faithful in your service. Amen. That's the first step to the throne. We can't go any further. We can't go any further in our Christian walk. We can't go up the mountain anymore unless we learn how to serve. Amen. To serve. You must be a servant before you can be a king. It's a tremendous message. Amen. So that servant who's running around that looks like he's a nobody, he's lowly, He's meek, he might not have much, but he's giving of his time and effort to help others. And he's not respected by people. He's looked down like, who's that? Well, the Bible says Jesus was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Isaiah 53, right? Amen? We despised him and esteemed him not. But he is the son of the living God. We first have to be like those lowly servants with no recognition, with no thank you sometimes, because it's all for him. He said, hey, you're doing good, my son. You're doing good, my daughter. You're going up the mountain, and you're going to make it to the top. Amen. Pastor Foster told me, he said, he said to me one day, he said, not everybody wins Christ. In Philippians 3, Paul said, I give up everything, and I count all of my accomplishments, all of my achievements, I count them but dumb, trash, that I might win Christ. He's the prize. I said he's the prize is to win Christ. What does that mean? That means to have him living in your life in such a powerful way that it makes a difference to everyone around you. It makes a difference in your life, number one, and it makes a difference in everybody in your house and out of your house and everywhere you go that it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And you've made a difference because he's the difference within you. And people even tell you you're a different person. Some people never change. They can only change with Christ in them. Amen. He's changing you from glory to glory. Amen. I said he's changing you, and that's called growth. Yes. If you don't see any change, then you need to pray. We all need to pray until we get a breakthrough. If you're at a place where you're stagnant, where you're dry, that's normal. Yeah. It's normal. You know why? Because that's what causes you now to be motivated to go to the next level. If you feel all satisfied where you are, you're not going to seek for anything more. Amen. Well, pastor, I feel so dry. Yeah, that's normal. That's normal. Because God says, I want you to press in. Yes. Press in and touch the hem of my garment. Yes. How many know there's a garment to press into? Yes. There's a garment of Jesus for you to get a hold of. Did you know that today? That garment's right in front of you. And you can press in and you can touch that power Amen. that will heal you, that will deliver you, that will set you free, that will give you the miracle that you need. Am I too loud in this? No. If I am, turn me down. No, I don't know. I guess it's okay. <laughs> hallelujah. hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Well, hallelujah. hallelujah. We're going to keep on praising God. Amen. 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 Mark 10, 43 through 45, Jesus said, when they were asking, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And James and John said, can I sit on one side? And I guess it was his mother that was involved in that one, right? The good, good mother they had. The sons of thunder had a thunderous mom. And she said, hey, could you have James sit on one side and John on the other side? And Jesus said, it's not for me to give that. But they're asking, well, then they're all the rest of the disciples were like, who do they think they are, you know? <laughs> But, you know, that's just human nature. 
But Jesus said, oh, it's not going to be that way like it is with the Gentiles and the non-Jews. He said that the ones that are in great power and authority, they rule and dominate everybody else. Listen, if you're in a place of authority, if you're a manager, supervisor, you need to still be gentle. You can be strong, but you need to be gentle. We're not supposed to be like the world that just like dictators. And men, men, you need to be gentle with your wives. You can be a gentle leader. You're still the boss, but you don't have to go around saying it. Just wear a Boss Hugo shirt. No, just kidding. They, they have that now, no boss. That's a, that's a nice saying with a lot of people now. It's, it's, you know, people go, hey, boss, you know, you heard that's real popular. But God, God wants you to know he's the boss. Amen. 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 It's not going to be that way among you, but whoever will be great among you, who wants to be great? You should all say yes, because we want to be great for Jesus. Whoever wants to be great among you shall be your minister. That means someone who gives. And whoever will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Amen. 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 Servant of who? Of some people? Of the pastor and his wife? The servant of all. What? That's what it says. That's what Jesus said. Amen. Who will be the chiefest among you? And that chiefest means the most important one. The one who's above everybody else, that's what it means. The one who'll be above everyone else, the most important person in the church, in your home, is the servant of all. The one who's serving everybody else. Not just, not just some, but everybody. For even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Someone say amen. Amen. So to become a servant, this is a definition. It's an expanded definition. One who gives his will up in order to serve the will of another. That is one of the greatest messages that we can ever get a hold of, of what it means to be a servant of God, that we are one who gives up our will to serve another person's will. And that's hard to do. People don't understand how that works because when you do that, when you give up your will, to serve another person's will, like I wrote here, to, to help and fulfill another person's desire, calling, and vision. When you do that, then God will send people along to fulfill your vision. That's how it works in the kingdom of God. Yeah, when, you give, when you give up all the side of yourself, and we give up our big egos. Yes, amen. Amen. Ooh, gone to meddling now. It's true. We don't realize sometimes we have an ego problem. Well, I don't have an ego problem. I have an inferiority problem. Yeah, but inferiority causes an ego problem to exist. You know why? Because then you you constantly want to feed that ego that's trying to say, I'm important. I need to find different things that kind of bolster my importance and my value. It's actually based on inferiority. When a person has an ego, they have to constantly try to prove themselves because they actually inside their heart don't feel that good about themselves and they don't feel that loved. It all comes from God. Your love and value comes from Him. It's vertical, man. It's vertical, man. It's vertical, woman. It comes from Him. You can't get it from another person. You can't even get it from your spouse or from a mouse. No, I like to rhyme. You can't get it from your house. You can't get it from your job. You can't get it for how much money you have. Amen. People think they got a lot of money. makes them feel important. Oh, here comes that rich person. Oh, and you know what they do? They get that kind of aura about them like, oh, that person's famous. That person's wealthy. That doesn't make them valuable. Their value is based on how much God loves them, how much he shed his precious blood on that cross, that he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that's how valuable you are is that god loves you and he shed his blood and he poured out his blood on that cross the precious blood of jesus the pure pure sinless holy blood of the lamb of god of jesus christ of nazareth he shed his blood for you Turn and tell somebody, he shed his blood for you. And he shed his blood for me. Say, me, 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 for me. The biggest problem is me. The biggest problem is not the person next to you. It's me. I'm talking for you and me, all right. 
That's right. It is. It's true. You think, oh, no, no. If things were different, if I wasn't with that person, if I had a different circumstances, if I lived somewhere else, if I had a better education, if I had more money, if I was in a different church, the pastor don't talk so long. <laughs> then I would be so much better. No, it's not true. It's not true at all. It's a lie. Amen. I told you the grass is not greener on the other side, especially in Phoenix. It's dead. It's full of rocks. I remember when I first came here from California, it's like I, saw, I never saw lawns full of rocks before. I said, man, they really don't have any water here. Is that lawns full of rocks. Oh, that's real comfortable. I'm going to go lie down on those rocks. Oh, my goodness. And then when I go back to California where I was born, forgive me, but I was born there. It was really wonderful. And it's so green. I'm looking around. and go, look at all the trees. And people looking at me like, is he okay? Look at, there's a tree. It's green. You know, like we come over here. If you've been here a number of years, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. And you know, if you know you've really been here a long time, you start looking and say, it's beautiful out here in this dry desert. <laughs> look at that beautiful cactus. <laughs> oh, look at that needle. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> we get like that, don't we? Yeah. Don't we? We see the beauty in it, though. <laughs> Amen. Jesus said he came to minister, not to be ministered unto. We've got to turn this around. It's not about you. It's about him. It's not, you're not going to make a big splash in the pan. He's the big splash. There's no superstar here. There's only the bright morning star. If we make Jesus a star in our ministry, in our lives, in our family, we're going to see the power of God move. If we try to be the one that's getting all the attention, then we need some healing, some deliverance. We need some inner healing. We need God to get rid of all those spirits. Amen. Oh, yeah. Stop carrying around all that baggage. Amen. God doesn't want you to have baggage. He wants you to have luggage. Amen. Amen? Luggage means you're going places with God, but baggage is stuff from the past that you bring into your current relationship, and it's not even their fault. You're still taking it out on that person from the past. Yes. You got to get rid of it. Give it. Take it to the cross and get rid of all the baggage. Come on, some of us are carrying around so much baggage. We're bent over. We're weighed down. No wonder we can't see what Jesus is doing. Get rid of it all. Stop talking about your past. I said stop talking about your past. Start talking about what God's doing in your life and what he's going to do. How many know it's a new beginning? This is a time of new beginnings. Hallelujah. Becoming a servant means that you're going to help fulfill the desire and calling and vision of, of another person. That's what God wants you to do. And we've got to make that our mandate. We've got to make that. That's our commission. That's our goal is we're here to help others get closer to Jesus. We're here to help others and assist them in fulfilling the will of God in their life. That's called intercessory prayer. When you're praying and you're pleading the cause of another. What does intercession mean? I'm glad you asked that question. It means that you're standing like an attorney and you're pleading the cause in that, of that person of their issues before the throne of God. You're not representing yourself. You're not praying for yourself. You're praying for that person and you're asking God to help them. You're asking God to give them that breakthrough. You're asking God to give them what they need in their life to become the man and the woman that God has called them to be. Right? And that's the love of God. And then you'll start sensing the love of God. You know, you know, the love of God is when you start weeping over people you don't even know that well. When you start loving people that you don't even know, that's the love of God. The love of God is not when you just love those who love you. That's not the love of God. I got information for you. I got a wake up call for you. That's just love. And people have love. There's human love. But God's love transcends our human love. God's love will have you weeping and crying for somebody that you don't even really know that you're going to love them with the love of God, that you're going to start weeping because God's weeping through you for that person. God's praying through you. That's when you come to know the heart of God. When you start doing things for others, not because you're going to get something in return. You give of your tithe and offering because you want to help God. You want to bless God. You want to minister to God. It's a ministry. Giving is a ministry. I said giving is a ministry. He gave his life as a ransom for many. A servant is one who what? Serves others. Doesn't that make sense? What is servanthood? One who serves. Serves who? Others. Well, but I don't like people very well, one man told me. One minister told me that. He got so tired and burned out helping people. He was a prophet of God. From the morning to the night, his phone was off the hook. He had to, he had to hang up his phone. 
because he had such a word in his mouth from God. People would bug him and call him at all hours of the night. In the morning, he finally told me, I'm sick and tired of all this. He said, I'm tired. I'm tired of people. I said, you better stop everything and pray because God, God's not going to help you then. Because you know why? People are the object of God's love. Amen. How many still here? People are the object of God's love. If we're not praying and helping others, there's no love flowing through us. Love is something you do. Turn and tell somebody, love is something you do. Someone that serves is one who is a worker. Say, I want to be a worker. How many want to sign up and be a worker? We need your help here at the church. That's what I love about a growing church. There's plenty to do here. It's not taken up. There's plenty of areas here for you to fill up. Praise the Lord. How many of the Bible says that the, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few? Jesus said that. You know what a laborer is? A worker. God wants you to be a worker. Come on, God wants you to be a worker bee. In God's kingdom. Hallelujah. Bring in the honey. One who gets things done. How many other things have got to get done? Are you listening to me anymore? If you're not getting things done around here, then maybe you're not working. Don't complain. Get things done. So don't be part of the solution. I mean, part of the problem, be part of the solution. I said it backwards. Because when you're working, you're getting things done. Turn to tell somebody, get her done. You got to get things done. So we need your help to get things done. I started the church out of my living room. I did. I started the church out of my living room 30 years ago. 30 years ago, in April 1994, I had a prophecy from Bill Hammond said, within this year, you're going to start a church. I didn't, three months later, from February, March, April, maybe, maybe it was May, maybe it was this month. But it was three months later, I started the church. I think it was the end of April. And I started my living. You know, the first thing I realized is I needed people's help. Don't matter what kind of calling you got, don't matter what kind of gifting you have, you need other people to help serve. And if you get faithful people, if you get faithful workers, you're going to have a church. That's what we have as Miracle Life Church, based on people here that are hard workers for Jesus, that want to do their part. And, and that's even giving of your time. I wrote down here, this is all what it means. It means to get things done, to be worthy of reliance or trust. You know, that's part of being a servant, is you, we can rely on you. You're reliable. You're worthy of it because you've proven it. How do I know that? Because you've proven it. We can trust you. We can trust you because you're faithful. You're dependable. You can't say that about everybody. I've had gifted people come through this church over years and years of ministry, and some of them were so anointed, but they didn't stay all the time. They're always here and gone the next. Listen, be faithful. And God knows your circumstance. Be here as much as you can. Amen? But, but be, be of use. It means to be of use. That means I want to be useful in the kingdom. And we'll help you. We'll help you understand here how to do that, to be useful. Say, make time available. I mean, you've got to make time available. If you don't make time available, you can't be used. You're too busy. Amen. Turn and tell somebody, be a busy bee for Jesus. It means to be a worshiper. Did you know that? To be a servant means to be a worshiper. Because why? Because we're serving God with our singing. We're serving God with our worship, with our heart. Come on. What is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, I'm a servant. I'm a Say, I'm a worshiper. I'm a worshiper. Write this down. Psalm 68, 11. This is all for the women here. The Lord gave the word. Psalm 68, 11. The Lord gave the word, but great was the company of women who were worship warriors who published it, who gave it out. Isn't that beautiful? That's in the Hebrew. All the women should say amen or a, women, or a woman. A woman, amen. A child, say amen. God's going to have you give out that word because you're a worship warrior. How many has been worshiping God? We don't worship God enough. How many would say amen to that? Are you putting praise music on during the day? Are you putting praise music on in your car? Are you, are you praying with your husband and wife? Are you praying with your family? Are you worshiping God together? Huh? I'm doing a checkup on you. That's a spirit-filled life. Let's go up the mountain. Let's not stay in the valley. Let's not stay in the lowlands. Let's not let our, our existence and our family life and the reality of what goes on every day behind the closed doors be in the flesh. 
on a carnal level where we don't talk nice to each other, we don't act nice to each other, where we just say things that are bad to each other, even bad words and getting angry and upset and being fussy. That's, that's the reality of many people's lives that are Christians. And they come to the church and they say, hallelujah, how you doing? Oh, praise God. Amen. I'm just trying to animate that for you. <laughs> it's true. God wants to bring that glory in your home. He wants that mountaintop to be in your home. He wants you to bring your level of relationships up higher. Don't talk them down. Don't put them down. Put them up. Don't put them down to the ground. Don't condemn them. Don't be critical, but lift them up. Begin to believe God for them. Be believe God will do great and mighty things in their life. That God will change those things you're concerned about. That God will move those mountains out of the way. He will fill those valleys. He will make those crooked ways straight and those rough places smooth because you'll be a carrier of God. His servant is carrying the water. A carrier, like you brought in water. We saw those bringing in water to drink of. We put it in the refrigerator here. And you know, you're a servant. You're doing that. If you didn't go get that water, nobody would be able to drink it. Amen. Say, I'm a carrier of the water. Come on. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank God for every servant that's here in this house today. Everybody that's been here that's helped in this ministry, we appreciate you. We really do. We can't do this by ourselves. Teamwork makes the dream work. Amen. Everybody say, teamwork makes the dream work. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going too long for you, right? Praise God. How many know when you become a servant, then you're going to have that journey to the throne room? Amen. Then God's going to give you more responsibility because if you're faithful in little, you're faithful in much. If God can trust you with a little, he'll give you more. Come on, we got to be consistent in our giving. we got to be consistent in our attendance. we got to be consistent in our Christian walk and our prayer time and our time in the Word of God. God wants to trust you. And if God can trust you, He can entrust you. Then He can give you things to be a steward, a carrier. Hallelujah, of what He has for you. Now, Isaiah 31, 1 and 2 in your notes. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness. That's Jesus. This is prophesying about Jesus. And princes will rule with justice. Say, that's us. That's us, princes and princesses. You're, say, I'm a princess if you're a woman. If you're a woman. We believe in gender here. If you're a woman, say, I'm a princess. If you're a man, say, I'm a prince. And it says what? It says the king's going to reign in righteousness and princes will rule. God's going to cause you to rule with justice. And each one of them shall be like a hiding place from the wind and a shelter from the storm. That's talking about these last days. We're going to be a hiding place from the storm, a shelter from the wind, like streams of water in Phoenix, Arizona. Streams of water in a dry place, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Isn't that beautiful? I said, isn't that beautiful? God says that's what he's going to make you. Turn to the one next to you and say, you're going to be a hiding place from the wind. Point at them. Say, you're going to be a shelter from the storm. Say this, you're going to be like streams of water in a dry place. You're going to be like a shade. Boy, we need that in this heat. Beside the rock, the great rock, from the rock in a weary land. Hallelujah. You're, like a, you're a great rock, and you're going to shade. In verses 3 and 4, the heart also of the wrath shall understand knowledge and this is, if you want to look at it, in Isaiah 32, 4. Yeah. It's actually verse 3. It says, The eyes of them that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall listen. See, that means God's going to use you as being that point of contact of revelation knowledge. Now their eyes are going to be open. Their ears are going to be open. Why? Because you now have become that person that is a hiding place from the storm. The heart also of the wrath shall understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. That means you're not going to stutter anymore. God's going to put his word in your mouth. You're going to speak out that word, and people are going to receive. People are going to have knowledge. People are going to understand knowledge. Hallelujah. Because you're that place of the gospel. You're that person giving out the good news. And that good news is the light of God that's going to open people's eyes. Hallelujah that are in darkness, the light of God is going to shine through you. Turn and tell somebody, the light of God is going to shine through you. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. 
It's a beautiful chapter here. You've got to read the whole thing. It's so beautiful. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Let's all stand. In Revelation 3.21, we know Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. God wants to sit down with you. Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. He's knocking at the door of the church. He wants to come in. But the next verse says, once he comes in, he's going to make you an overcomer. The one who overcomes, I will grant for him or her to sit beside me on my throne. Even as I myself overcame and sat down beside my father on his throne. What a promise. Amen. Amen. How many like that? God says you're going to become one that rules and reigns over your circumstances. You're not, you're not the tail, you're the head, not the tail. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit today. Lift your hands with me right now, everybody. We pray for the power that raised Jesus from the dead, that resurrection power. Go through each person listening to my voice right now. Let the power of God hit them, Father. Let them feel your presence, Lord. Lift them up right now, Lord. We break everything from the past, all that baggage, Lord. We tear it off in Jesus' name. We pray for a process of inner healing to take place, that every broken place of the heart will be healed, that every wound, every hurting place will be healed. No more carriers of wounds, but now carriers of his glory, carriers of his love. No more carriers of hatred and unforgiveness, but now carriers of love and forgiveness and peace. We pray right now, Father, for an establishing of each person in the mountain of God that, Lord, where each place we take our feet upon, every time we take a step, we're going to go into an established place that we're going to say, this belongs to me. This is mine. I'm possessing what belongs to me in Christ Jesus. I shall not be moved. But I'm going to become like a hiding place from the wind. I'm going to become a shelter from the storm in these last days. And people shall come running because they will see when they come to me that I have Jesus in me, that I have the answer they're looking for, that I have the power that will set them free from the power of Satan in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I know it's a heavy message today. Amen. Hallelujah. Actually, we got a song we're going to put on.